couple of years ago, we, Amos Four Green, started this lecture series. It's really designed for the community. And so I start with that before welcoming you because it's very important that uh, you be careful of the conversations that you have, realizing there may be individuals from the community that don't know anything about Freemasonry. So with that said, welcome. Thank you to our community series, lecture series. Um, tonight's lecture is by a stonemason who is not a Freemason. That's very important. So during the Q&As, be mindful of that. He's not going to be able to make those distinctions that you may be looking for. But that's the whole point of this lecture. The lecture is, is to tie in the operative Freemasonry that we always talk about, we always study, but never really get an opportunity to witness and observe. So this lecture is meant to allow you to make the connections. So be mindful of that uh, when you ask questions. So with that, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Chris. Thank you, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. I really appreciate being invited. Um, mechanization, the process of converting a, a manufacturing process which would be done by hand, by people, into a process that would be done by machines. Uh, I don't believe it's the enemy. I don't believe that all mechanization is, is bad news, but it's one of the major forces that is, has driven stone carving, stone masonry, woodworking, leather craft, iron working to the brink of extinction. And I, f I personally feel like that's a tragedy and I'm probably one of very few people around who can say from personal experience how valuable it is, not just in terms of the finished product, but how valuable it is to people, to human traditions, and to culture that these uh, <coughs> handcrafts be uh, enabled to exist into the 21st century and beyond. Yeah? Just a question. Is it, uh, do you mind if we take pictures while you're No, no, please, feel free. Yeah. Great question. I'd like to dedicate this lecture, this presentation, to uh, Dean James Morton, who recently died. He was not a stonemason, he wasn't a Freemason, but he was the guy who saw the value of uh, the tradition of stone carving and stonemasonry, and he, he kept it alive. He brought it into my life because he resumed construction under his leadership the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in Manhattan resumed construction and eschewing modern mechanized methods, they, they decided to train local people in ancient traditional methods of handcraft. He saw the value in that and he was determined that if the cathedral was going to continue building that it would be built by these traditional methods. So I, I'd like to dedicate the, uh, this presentation to his memory. Now, um, I was going to start, I am going to start by going into my story. We all love stories, and I'm sure a lot of you have stories more fascinating than mine, but being that I'm the stonemason and I have the floor tonight, I'll start with my story. I was born in, in, in Manhattan. Uh, my, my dad is a photographer. My mom worked in a school. Uh, when I was about... Seven years old, my parents saw uh, publicity in a store window about the cathedral, the cathedral school. They were in the market looking for a place for my, my brother and I to go to school, so they took a look and, and thought it was great because the school was founded to provide a choir to sing inside the cathedral way back in the early 1900s. It had updated, and now it wasn't a boarding school for nine boys anymore. It was a co-ed and it was a day school but it was a great place to go to school it was right in the shadow of the cathedral and when I was in about seventh grade Dean Morton he decided to resume construction on the cathedral they had shut down construction uh, when World War II started 
and they never they never started again, partly because they felt like maybe they were worried about the public relations aspect of putting money into constructing a majestic and rich building when there was poverty and human needs of, of uh, hunger and housing. But he had the insight to realize that, yes, we're continuing to build this glorious building, but it's a gift to the people who become involved. They're not employees in a fast food restaurant or in a factory who are not really using that much of their uh, intellectual potential. They're going to be, it's a gift to them. And he invested in the people that were being trained there. He invested years and, uh, well, at least two years of training before the people were able to contribute anything to the project because the stonemasonry craft it takes a lot it takes a lot of training and practice before you're able to contribute so that's an investment in the people and they might just leave they might say ah, I don't like it here and, and then you've, you've lost your investment so that's very significant to me anyway uh, I was only in seventh grade and when they started. I didn't really care about it that much. I, I finished uh, cathedral school in eighth grade. I went on to high school. Uh, my friend Charlie and I, we went to Stuyvesant High School back in uh, 1980. Ba down? No? Yeah. Oh, Brooklyn Tech. Okay, well, that, that, that's a good one, too. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, I got a, a great education in uh, sedentary pursuits in information processing and, and being able to memorize facts. However, there was very little that was, and I'm not blaming Stuyvesant, this is the educational system in general, there was very little that was animating my, uh, my hunger, feeding my hunger for uh, something to do with my hands, something to do with materials and tools. And I wasn't even really sure that, that I want, I, I didn't know that I wanted that yet. Anyway, I finished high school. I was getting burned out on the academics, but everyone is going to college, so I just followed the herd, and I went to college too, even though I didn't know why. But um, I went to NYU. I've never left New York City. Uh, and I continued to, you know, burn out. <laughs> and I really didn't know where I was headed. My parents were very, like, hands-off, and they weren't, like, saying, oh, you should investigate this, you should investigate that. They just said, find your thing. Well, I didn't find it until after college, I had a job uh, in renovating apartments with a construction company. I was introduced to tools, hand tools, electric tools, materials, mostly two by fours, plywood, you know, sheetrock. And I was really happy, but unfortunately, they were paying me, because I didn't know what I was doing, to do the most low-level menial things, which is mostly unloading trucks and sweeping. But it gave me a sense of direction that I want to learn techniques. I want to learn a craft. I want to learn to make things out of materials. And modern construction, unfortunately, there's a lot of intelligent and capable people in modern construction, but unfortunately, they're not being given the opportunity to have a piece of raw material put on their table and to be asked to transform that block of stone or that piece of timber or that piece of metal <coughs> into something to dramatically transform it for, a, uh, for beauty or for a useful purpose. It's more assembling things that are delivered on site, uh, which is, takes skill. Absolutely, it takes skill. But it doesn't take the kind of skill and depth of uh, training and techniques that I was really feeling that I wanted in my life. So I remembered what I'd seen at the cathedral when I was just uh, 12 years old. I went back there and I asked them if they'd give me a chance, if they'd let me become an apprentice. I was persistent. I used whatever contacts and connections and resources that I could. And eventually they, they did give me a chance to do it. And basically the first day I did it, I knew I was in the right place and I had connected with something that was going to really make me happy. So uh, I stayed with the training program for only two years because mechanization, they were bringing in some robotic uh, automatic stone shaping CNC uh, machines 
because they, 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 they thought they, they wanted to get the job done faster. There's all, so much work to do. There's lifetimes of work to do there, but they wanted to speed things up. They were under the mistaken impression that the craft and the satisfying work is in the finishing. It's in, it's in like the, the surface. And they say, well, we're freeing the craftsmen to, to just get to that last stage. But you know, by the time you get to that last stage, most of the important decisions have been made. You're just, I mean, it's very important, the final details, but you really don't have much flexibility to uh, innovate or to do something like the road to set. You, you've gone to, you've gone 95 percent of the journey and it's just the last five miles. Uh, so I disagreed with that and besides since I was one of the newer people I wasn't going to be doing any of the interesting things. I was going to be doing like with a sander, you know, uh, after the machine is done there's like steps like uh, Space Invaders, the digitized sort of and you have to sand that out to make it a flowing curves in the moldings or whatever the stone is meant for. And that's not uh, interesting work, it's not challenging work, and that I was so uh, turned on by what I'd been doing, I didn't want to stop. So even though I had no clear vision, there was no other cathedral across town where I could, you know, transition. I had no idea how I was going to continue doing this thing that I was excited about, but I knew I wasn't going to be able to do it there, so I, uh, I left. Shortly after I left, they went out of business anyway. So it proved to be not that bad a decision. And uh, as I say, there was very little need for stonemasons. The cathedral was anachronism. They were building in a way which was completely obsolete. Buildings today are basically steel frame or concrete reinforced with steel frame and if there is stone, it's basically a thin veneer that's anchored onto those materials that really provide the, the strength to hold the building up. Not so with the cathedral, not so with the medieval cathedrals, not so with the Roman temples and Greek temples and Renaissance buildings. Those buildings were built stone upon stone so that the, the stone... And this is what you guys know as stone masonry. Most people outside, I just talk about stone carving because people don't know stone masonry. Stone masonry is the craft of shaping geometrical blocks for construction. Differing from stone carving, which is the carving of ornamental foliage or the capitals at the top of the columns, which is also differentiated from sculpture, where you're not so much providing uh, a consistent decorative ornament as something which stands alone. A sculptor could carve something which would stand alone and it's expressive and it's meant to, uh, I guess, communicate the person's aesthetics and feelings. Okay, so stone masonry, it's, uh, it's almost out of business except for restoring ancient buildings. So there was nowhere to go with that skill. I decided I needed to learn something else if I wanted to continue, which was either inscribing letters in buildings, or cemetery monuments, or uh, sculpture, <coughs> which is still alive, even if it's not that much geared towards stone carving, there's still sculpture. There's still ornamental decorative carving in terms of fireplace mantles and garden benches and things like that. So. I didn't know any of that stuff. I had a very good, I was at a first step because I knew how to shape stone. I knew how to work these tools with great accuracy, but I didn't know that much about carving. So I had to find some other people around in a less formal, the training I had at the cathedral was very formal. There were steps and challenges where you were given it a higher level challenge when you had mastered the previous. But with the carving, it was more something I, I picked up from people in an informal way. And I learned the inscriptions uh, to do lettering on my own. And that's what has kept me involved in stone carving for uh, almost 30 years, is, is the uh, ability to uh, do this, the carving. Very little stone masonry 
that uh, comes my way. And I guess if there's one thing I can put across to you, being that you are the Freemasons, is to have a real sense of just how rich and how amazing the craft of stone masonry is. Because, as we all know from playing with blocks on the rug in kindergarten and joining Legos together to build structures, you can do a lot with a six-sided block with an ashlar. You can do a lot. But there's a lot you can't do. I mean, you cannot make an arch with rectangular 90 degree blocks. Those are called voussoirs because they're, they're tapered and one side is curved. You know, the inside mm -hmm. surface is curved. They're not uh, 90 degree, as I said, because they're shaped, uh, they taper so that you can arrange them in, in an arc. And you bring the keystone in the middle to hold it together. Exactly, and when you remove the wooden support, it all stays together because the weight is, is being transferred to each lower stone and pushing out, and maybe there's another arch coming from both sides which, you know, balance out that. So, uh, but even the arch, that's just a step above a baby, a, a simple ashlar. Imagine a dome, right? A dome has a spherical inner surface. The ceiling is spherical. Most likely the outside, you know, outside the building, the outside is spherical as well. The joints, which mean the places where the stones meet, the joints of a course of stones in a dome is a cone, you see? Each stone has, well, there are two flat surfaces where the uh, to the left and right, but the top bed is a cone, the bottom bed is cone, and the inside and outside surfaces are, are spherical. So to, to imagine having a block of stone like this put on your table, and you'd have some templates, which are like uh, patterns, the sheet metal or plastic to apply, and to think about, well, where do I begin? That's, that's a big challenge. It's a big, and most of the guys in the Medieval ages were, were illiterate. They hadn't been to college. They, they, they learned these things from, just from practice. They were handed down from the masters to the apprentices. Uh, and that's, even that is not as high as it goes. But without pictures to show you, it just gets very confusing. So, uh, in fact, when you're out walking around the city, you see the stoops, they have handrails. They don't just curve out on, on a level, they curve out as they go down. So that's a helix, right? That's, that's complicated stuff, and it, it's, it's, uh, it's a big challenge, and I want, if nothing else, to give you any, a big respect for stone masonry because it's not just ashlars. Although even that, even ashlars are a challenge in the execution, in, in, in the using the tools to, to achieve the flat surface. So. I know the Freemasons are big on analogies because the whole thing is based on an analogy. The, the, Freemason, the, free, the craft of, of stone masonry is an analogy to, as far as I understand it, to character, to having a, a good quality character. Well, I like to use analogies in, when I train people too. And one of the things that I, I, I use is talking about the craft and the different levels of competence. The first level of competence, which is like the apprentice level, is learning to use the tools. Learning to use these chisels, hammers, and axes to define with, with accuracy and ec economy of effort to define a flat surface or a precise curved surface. That's like driving. That's like learning to drive the car. You're just a, an operator. If, you needed to, if I needed to get home from here, and I, I don't have no idea where I am, I just followed the uh, navigation, right? So I was just an operator. I was just following instructions which are coming to me over my phone. Without the phone, I'd be helpless. And I almost ran out of power, so I know what that feels like. Um, so the second level of competence 
you've got the skill with the tools, the second level of comp competence is knowing how to approach in a methodical ma manner a, 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 a block like this, which is your starting point, how to know how to use these tools and, and what steps to take to turn it into the thing that someone else is telling you to make. Mm -hmm. And you can probably imagine what the third level is. The third level is being able to come up with an idea or design for what you're going to do. So that's like, this is being able to drive. The step two is not, being able, not only being able to drive, but being able to navigate and find your way from here to there, like being a cab driver and say, Grand Central Station, oh, I know how to get there. So the third level of competence is not just being able to drive, not just being able to navigate, but being able to decide where you're going to go. Because you can just take the tools and start going, but that's like getting in the car and driving and saying, well, I hope I end up somewhere nice. The, the third level of competence is being able to say, I know where I want to go. And, and then being able to find your way and, and, and being able to drive yourself there. So that's an analogy for the three levels of competence. And you don't have to isolate the first one before you start thinking about the second one. You can incorporate learning the guidance while you're doing your uh, learning to use the tools and learning to design things too while you're learning to use the tools. But they are hierarchy. There's a hierarchy. There's lots of uh, analogies that I use. But mm, it's time to get some energy going. It's time to do something, uh, and we, we can go back to talking later. But I'm going to start to uh, shape this stone. I'm going to start to do what, I, what they had me do for a whole month. They would, when I started at the cathedral, they just took a pencil and drew a, a, a line about an inch and a half, two inches down from the top, and said, just take it down. Just make a flat surface. Uh, at a lower level. And that sounds boring, and it is boring from a certain standpoint because you're not creating something. You're not creating something exciting. But it's so challenging to use those tools and to learn how to, how to do it that it's not boring. It's a big, pretty big challenge. And if I had... Uh, I'm skipping a step because if you have two straight edges, you have to do this and you have to wiggle them and sight along the tops to make sure that you're getting a, a real plane. Because if I just do it this way, this line, this line that I draw on this side might not be parallel with the line that I draw on that side and things don't come out so well. But this is just a demo, so forgive me for uh, skipping that step. While I'm doing this, I hope you'll feel free, especially if you're in the back, feel free to come up closer to the front. It's probably going to take me about 20 minutes. Feel free to look at the tools that are here on the altar. Feel free to look at the uh, book there that has photographs of my, uh, yeah, you, you can hold them, yeah. Feel free to look at the book with pictures of my uh, past work. Victor, don't touch the setting board. <laughs> <laughs> How good are you at thinking that you just, by eyesight, got it? Well, we'll see when it's done. <laughs> <laughs> and that was my, my question for you. How come you don't use a level? A level? Yeah, to make sure yeah, it's... Yeah, like, I could do that. Yeah. yeah. Dave used laser. It's a lot easier. <laughs> exactly what he was saying. Everything's easy. Everything's easy. Yeah. You did. This is limestone. When I was being trained, the master, before he let me uh, stop doing this, he said, you have to be able to put the straight edge on the surface that you created, and if I can pass a cigarette paper underneath the... the Straight edge at any point, you fail. You have to go back and do it again. So I will endeavor today to do it um, to that level of accuracy. 
What's that, Charlie? Five dollars says I can't do it. <laughs> just want everybody to be mindful that while he is working on stone, they will be mad at that is flying. So uh, be mindful of that in the back. Of the if you're in the back, I don't know if it's okay, but yeah, yeah, sit right this, over there. this seat, these benches are, are good for uh, watching too. No goggles. Ah, I forgot. I knew I forgot something. Huh? That's well, the first thing. Safety first. Yeah. This one is the pitch. It's a great tool for breaking off big pieces, but it only works from around the outside. It puts a big shock into the stone. That's why it's so robust. You know, it puts a big shock. guy showed them to me initially, so he, French words. he, I don't think he knew what the English word was, and, and I, I didn't ask, I just How did what he did. How long did that piece take to make? What? How long did that piece take you to make? This, uh, about six days. Oh. There's also another piece on the back, if you uh, on the way out, if you want to look at it, it's a flower that he did as well. What did you call the piece in your hand? That's called a. I just call it the hammer. No, no, the other hand. Sorry. <laughs> the pitch. Pitch. Okay, pitch. the pitch. Is there an angle on that that you, one goes up and one goes down? Yes. Because yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. wondering it's if it's not symmetrical. It's not symmetrical down the axis. There's one edge that sticks out more, and that's the one that you you hold against the delivers the shock. Right. Because if you held that upside down, the opposite effect will occur. Correct. If you well, hit that, you damage the lower portion of what you're going across. Not in this application, because oh. there's no way you'd break anything with, with this okay. much stuff here. Yeah. yeah. Do you have to like read a grain on, on this stone? Before you yeah, do maybe you guys over here can see there's the shadows, <laughs> uh, but it doesn't really affect that much the way the stone breaks. There's some stones which is very pronounced and it's much weaker. The, the a, layers separate. That's what I was going to ask you. If you do it, like, I know that this stone is much um, softer. With, with marble, would it be that easy, or...? No, no, marble, you don't break as big pieces, and uh, you have to hit it a lot harder to, to get the pieces to break off. And granite is even a step harder than that. And this is limestone? Yeah. The next tool is called the punch. It's just like a rod of steel that's sharpened into a pyramid point at the end.
made it. So as I said, if I do my job well, I should not be able to pass a credit card under the straight edge. <laughs> How many of these blocks did you think you did before you became a proficient? Before they let me move on uh, in, the, in, in the training program, I did it for a month. With, and I didn't have a new block every time. They continue to. So I probably did 15 or 20 uh, surfaces. But just what I'm doing now took me a full day when I was starting. I've gotten a lot uh, faster at it. take a, a flat chisel, this one, which is just a, a, a rod of steel that's flattened down into a blade and uh, sharpened. What was the name of that one? Sorry. Flat chisel. chisel. Okay. And I'm just going to put it right on the pencil line because I, I stopped my pitching. I didn't go all the way down to the, because you can't really see the pencil line because of what you observed about how it's not really a sharpened edge, it's more like a, a surface. So you can you can go right to the pencil line with the flat chisel. Now, when you were starting out, how long was the demo they did for you before they said, "All right, have at it"? That I don't remember. I I think maybe maybe twenty minutes. That that that's a that's a. A hallmark of, of handcraft is that somebody can tell you something in, in five minutes and it takes you hours to internalize for your hands to learn it. Isn't it? You can be able to repeat the words of, of, the, of the instruction, but that doesn't even, I mean, that's better than nothing, but it doesn't mean you've mastered the, 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 the knowledge. Information and knowledge. 
Is it mostly visual, or are you feeling for anything in the stone as you're, as you're going? Mostly visual, yeah. You, definitely, uh, it takes a while, but you do begin to recognize that how tightly you're squeezing the tool impacts the uh, the way they work. Look how straight that line is. That's like a, that's amazing. Continue with, with the punching, trying to uh, trying to get a nice level uh, draft, which is like the frame or uh, path uh, framing. A board. I do, I do. I, I started a nonprofit about uh, five years ago, and I'm I'm uh, I'm starting to train people. And I realize that this activity is very mindful. It's very you focus, you concentrate. It's almost like meditative. So it's really good uh, form of therapy for people who have suffered uh, trauma. So I just ran a, a four month. Five-month paid full-time training program for veterans. And this is a way of helping
chisel except it's got these teeth the blacksmith uh, filed these teeth into it that's going to grind it down a little custom made tools that you use uh, not on not all of them the ones the ones i'm demonstrating well this is not and they weren't made for me they were made unique one at a time in a forge but they weren't made to my specifications And the, the claw, it's a refining tool. It's not a tool that's meant to dig deeper. The deepest uh, punch marks. Yeah, because if you went straight from the punch to the, the flat chisel, it would pluck a lot, the, meaning that the pieces would come out and, and leave a, a... It would dig out a little more than you wanted to. So the, um, the claw helps to... Minimize that. Do you have a certain angle all the time or it changes? That's the whole thing that makes it work or not is the angle. If you have it too direct, it just puts shock into the core of the stone and it doesn't really break off those pieces. If you have it too low, which is the beginner way, you have to use all this arm power just to keep it engaged and it doesn't really cut very well. So it, that's the whole uh, aspect that makes the chisels do their job well, is, is the angle. And you never go over the edge, you always have to turn and come in, or else you might lose that corner. Yeah, 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 yeah. to create a draft which is a border and the final the final tool in doing that is, is the flat chisel. I'm gonna make I'm gonna take this border or this frame to the the finished level with the uh, you know same chisel but no teeth. It's a, like a, uh, what's the word, the, uh, 
obelisk sort of yeah, shape with, with the, the pockets uh, sticking. You, you're fine. That was that you're had geometrically and uh, stone masonry. That was the biggest challenge. But as far as carving, uh, it was those faces with the leaves, the, the green man faces. Uh, yes. to, you know, to San Francisco. You're going to get tired and you're going to compromise on your idea of what you wanted to do because... You got, you got to grind it first, get it to a point where it's ready for the chisel. Yeah, yeah. I work with stone too, but not like you. But this is like a real work of art. Thanks. What kind of work do you do? I'm a contractor, so... I play with every kind of stone, with, with, with wood, with... My, my personal passion is wood. But I'm far beyond where you're at. You're at the professional level, not at the amateur level. Well, while Chris is, is, is knocking away at this, there's a couple things that I want to mention. Uh, I, I learned about Chris while attending Mariner's Lodge. They were having one of their, uh, one of their fellow crafts. In order for them to move up, they had to give a speech. And uh, this uh, fellow craft talked about how about uh, five, seven years ago, uh, he brought his daughter to a show that Chris was doing. And the thing that was very interesting is that uh, he had uh, uh, several displays, at least four, and the daughter went up, and Chris remarked that the daughter was the best one out of all of them. There's a lot of people who went up, they just gave up. They just gave up, and the girl continued acting. But the thing that was very interesting was about the fact that uh, before the show was all done, Chris felt compelled to finish each and every one of those stones. So with that said, uh, Chris is going to continue going through this. You're more than welcome to stay up here. We have food downstairs, so you will have to eat uh, now or later. I just want to bring that to your attention. Uh, you can go down, you can eat. It's on us. There's no fee, no anything like that. We want to thank you for coming here. And by all means, continue to watch Chris. And if you have questions, please uh, ask him. Uh, two other things. He mentioned his nonprofit organization, but also Chris also does a workshop where he provides, you know, for a fee, uh, he provides the stone and he teaches you a little bit about stone, uh, stone mason. So uh, that's very interesting. So if you don't get Chris's information, I believe that most of you have already have, uh, received emails from me. I will be more than happy to give you that information. Thanks, Avery. Um, yeah, if you like the, 
the demonstration and you're like, well, this is great. What do I do now? That's you could take a class. There's a one day class in my workspace, uh, five hour class. Um, all the tools are provided and the material. It's not like you walk away with a work of art, but you certainly get a, a feel for uh, what it's like. Not, not, not even a colorful bowl or something? <laughs> <laughs> you should try. No, 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 no. I don't know what you can do. No no and if you like the idea of um, commissioning work, I'd love to talk to you about doing a project for you. If you think, well, that's for millionaires or... or, or uh, People, very wealthy people. It is. Maybe you know some wealthy people. Maybe you can connect me to, uh, if you work for a, uh, an institution like a hospital or a church, or a, I, I'd love to. You know. I'm still looking for those rich hospitals to pay me. Yeah, yeah. Or, yeah. And also, if you're interested in doing a, a, a similar demonstration at your lot. Right. I mean, it's Beautiful. amazing that as Freemasons, we can go off our entire careers without ever meeting an operative mason. Let alone the operative mason that's not a female. Yeah. So we got yeah, a nice version. What he's doing is uh, it's taking me back about two thousand years back. <laughs> beautiful. I still don't know how a plum works. I've been trying to figure that out for a time. Because how many lodges have you done this for? Or? Uh, this is the first one. Oh, really? The first wow. one. Sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Once you go to one lodge, you're going to be working for the rest of your life. Why not do any other work? You see how they do something else, that they get the flat stones, and they try to make it look vintage. You know, for, for sidewalks and stuff like that in Europe. Yeah, like a fake, fake tool marks? Yeah. yeah. I actually seen it as Hebron. They, they actually pretty big in stone over there. Yeah. And uh, it's beautiful. You see 20 guys sitting down with hammers. And they take the flat pieces of marble and they just chisel it a little bit so it makes it look authentic. Like your job is taking Yeah, exactly. Take a little stack. It's actually a Hebron style. Most The first stone. The question is, was limestone your first stone? Yeah, that, that's the stone that they were using to uh, resume construction on the cathedral. So that's what I was trained on, and that's why I feel it's, I have to choice of cathedral. Can you work with marble? Yeah, I've worked with marble, and marble has the advantage of if you rub it and rub it, and you know it gets the translucence and the color comes out. But to me, the look of the tool marks on the limestone, you know, with the sun hitting it and the, the shot, the, that's like energy. That, I get very excited about that. Terracotta. Have you ever done any work with terracotta? No, it's a completely different uh, technique. It breaks very easily, though, with terracotta. I have a question for you. In, 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 the, in the history of building buildings, the, the, what is the what angle is what the, the degree of 33? What, 33? Yeah. Use yeah. it for crown holders. Yeah. Crown holders. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll show you uh, another tool now, which is very useful for. Uh, it's like the claw, but it works a little faster. It's uh, like a claw axe. Whoa.
good idea. Yeah. Go it's a far west. Do the chisels get dull? They do, yeah, but um, with stone masonry and, and limestone, it, it takes a long time. You don't have to sharpen them constantly, but if you're working with sandstone, which is a very abrasive stone, what would you do with a grinder? You chop it with a grinder or a special machine? Yeah, a bench grinder. Uh, Isn't it supposed to sharp itself just by working with it? I have not found that to be so. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're doing inscriptions, you have to have your tools the most sharp. That's true. And make sure everyone takes a look at the book on the side over here. Beautiful work. He did a wonderful monument to his brother um, uh, Charles Lindbergh in there, which is beautiful. He has the, uh, the whole spirit of St. Louis with the etchings. And beautiful, beautiful. So beautiful work. That's all his work. Yes. That's all his work. So here's one, one uh, last thing I'd like to say about the analogy. That's well, not really the analogy. One, the most common question that people ask when they find out I work with stone is like, what do you do if something goes wrong? What do you do if you're, if you're chiseling and something drops off that you didn't mean to, to have happen? And it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. And I feel like that's a great analogy to life because, I mean, why do they ask me that? Why don't they ask a surgeon that? Why don't they say, what happens when you do something wrong? Or an air traffic controller, what happens when you do something wrong? Because it happens. Because we, we know what happens when either one of those occupations. That's the problem. Let's just make happy little trees. <laughs> nobody's perfect, and you have to find a way to... Uh, I mean, you could start over. You could say, I'm going to throw it away and start over. Sometimes the mistake is that bad, and your client is that, that particular. Sometimes it's something nobody else is even going to notice. And sometimes it might be a mistake that even makes it better. You know, the person might say, wow, the finished piece, wow, how would you think of that? I'm, well, actually, that wasn't intentional. See the beautiful work there? That's amazing. Everyone, make sure you take a look one more page. It's about real. Oh, yes. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Very early on. Uh, then after a while. Well, that's not that big. It's actually not that big. They kept the mind. One piece. Yeah. Everything is made out of one piece. Yep. Oh, I thought that was like a, a full man sized thing. No, no, it's only about that thing. Oh, okay. I was going to say because I thought it was man sized. It's real busy. It's probably the most intimate person you can find. Right. You know, it's gorgeous. This one is? Oh! Have you ever made a totally perfect ash bar from a grain of lump of stone? Or is it always kind of start? I never did because usually you start with a rectangular block, so people have to change the size. Are the rectangular blocks? You don't have to do all six sides. Are the rectangular blocks just in the middle? Mostly sawn, yeah. Sometimes they're split, like this one. Like this one, like this one. That's where the one is. Do you have like the, is that the thing, like a pure boulder and make it into a... I think if it were limestone, yeah. In Freemasonry, you know, we've got the plumb and the level and the square. I think that's where it gets confusing. I don't think it's really the stone needs to make a perfect square. I've had to do sides from rough blocks. And once you have one side, you're just using the square to draw the lines. Well, that's where you would use those. still exposed to the weather up there. Yeah. I didn't know that was good. Or good. Very, very gentle. Go underneath the leaves you're doing all that? It's like crazy. 
but you can start by drilling and then expand the hole. That's like you know, it doesn't shake it, it can crack it, or it's very gentle. Yes, yeah, they make it all different sizes. And believe it or not, the, the piston, the thing that's acting as a hammer in a pneumatic chisel, is much lighter. Of course, the almost sure. is actually based on the But it just hits it like a thousand times a minute. So, uh, right, because remember, in, in England in 1717, would you be able to do a kind of demo where you show how a plumb is a level and all that stuff? Well, the plumb is for assembling stones, for, for building for building up the structure out of many stones. Make it straight. Take your roll, hang it, hang it, hang it, hang it, stone over a rope. You got a plumb right there. It gives you vertical. Because it hangs. So it gives yeah, you level gives you horizontal. Yeah, right. I think a lot of us have never seen it. Literally, it's very easy. You take the metal weight, metal weight with the with the with the loop in the inside side room, and that's it. That's it. You know, that is so hard. People, I mean, I'm still not really seeing it. There's more sophisticated ways of doing this. I mean, even levels have vertical. Levels are not that accurate. You never know if the bubble sitting exactly where it's going to be. Unless the level is brand new and it's good quality. What's that thing called? The Manessis? Whatever the... the yeah, 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 yeah. The... Stichmus. Uh, Stichmus, that's what it's called. Yeah. That was used by the Greeks. If you want to create a level point between this point and the other point, make it clear right. As long as that... Fill it with water. Let the water settle in. That's what the French watches. Do you ever use your left exactly. hand do it the other way? Yeah, this is a great. Just for this, I don't use it. I don't change hands with the hammer, but with this, I do. If it's a very long distance, then it should be okay. Right, it's for me. I'm taking care of it. Yeah, my boss. Right. My wife's family is uh, Yeah, because of that work. My wife is that work. Obviously, you got to be focused on that. My mother in law is uh, uh, She's a. Yeah, i French. Pretty good. I think the French you know is my parents. When my wife orders some food, they say, Where is what? Where is this? Oh, it's on the shore of the vegetarian. Oh, I don't know that. That's awesome. Yeah. It's in the backyard of a town. Oh, well, Sam, I think that's great. Beautiful. Chris, usually start with the water's end. Yeah, very easy. Because that's the most fragile place. You have you have a reference too. You have two references at a right angle. But you're, when you're in the middle, you, you don't have as much. Uh, so it's good to start.
too much demands on your patience, especially with the odors of food coming up. Uh, 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 where, 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 uh, well, I'm sure if you're trying to hear this. Coming out, uh, this is really an honor. I want to thank you. I want to thank Chris. Uh, again, uh, if you don't get his information, you all have my email. Email me, and I will get it, give you his information. Uh, please tell your lodge about this. Our website is, uh, and I will send an email with our website, which will have of the video of today's uh, demonstration and some pictures so that you could disseminate amongst your lodges. Uh, Worshipful Master? Yes. If people took pictures now, are they able to put them up on their websites if they give credit to the lodge? Yes, by all means, by all means. And make sure you uh, give credit to Chris, that's the most important thing. Right, well, he, we have his paper, it has his name, and it has the lodge on it. So this way, the more people that are uh, informed, uh, the better we all are. So with that again, I want to say thank you to everybody for coming out. And we have for Chris. Please give Chris a round of applause. And as soon as you're done, please join us downstairs for coalition. Does he want to talk about his, his nonprofit now or what else downstairs? What would you like to do? He'll do it downstairs. He'll do it downstairs. Chris. Oh. Yeah. Everybody step back. That's <laughs> my beginning. Yeah. 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 Hey.